Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly health equity presentations. Today we have with us Dr. Crystal Fancher, who will be talking to us about breast cancer. Dr. Francher is a surgical breast oncologist who has expertise in treating patients with breast cancer and benign breast diseases. She specializes in novel treatments such as oncoplastic breast conserving surgery and intraoperative radiation therapy. Dr. Fancher was born in Santa Monica, California and knew at an early age that she wanted to be a physician. She did her surgical internship at Loma Linda, where her passion for breast cancer and women's health was ignited. She continued her general surgery training at MRSA in Macon, Georgia, where she fostered her special interest in the treatment of breast cancer and breast health. She then pursued advanced training at the University of Southern California, where she completed her fellowship in breast surgical oncology. She was awarded the 2020 Munsey Family Fellowship in Oncoplastic Breast Surgery. She's excited to be back in Santa Monica and providing care to breast cancer patients in the community she grew up in. When not at work, Dr. Fancher enjoys a good beach day or lounging by the pool and taking advantage of the great weather in Southern California. She can also be found at a Dodgers game. Ooh, ooh, ooh as she has been a fan since her early days playing softball. She also loves her Jeep Wrangler and likes to take it off-roading when she gets the chance. I wanna welcome Dr. Fancher and have you all welcome Dr. Fancher who will be enlightening us about uh, advances in breast health. Thank you, Dr. Fancher for coming to visit with us. Thank you so much, Helena. And thank you everyone for being here and inviting me to talk today. So as everybody knows, it is October, which means it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about breast cancer and some of the, the treatments and also some of the health disparities that we do see in breast cancer. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so again, I'm Crystal Fancher. I'm a surgical breast oncologist at the Margie Peterson Breast Center at Providence St. John's Health Center. Um, and I'm also assistant professor of surgery at the St. John's Cancer Institute, which is formerly the John Wayne Cancer Institute where I do research as well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go over the brief outline of what we'll talk to today. We've got a lot, so I'll try to talk quickly. Um, and then if we have any questions, we can always go back. Um, so I wanted to go through a little bit about breast cancer screening, um, a review of the different types of breast imaging, uh, symptoms that you wanna bring to your doctor's attention, risk assessment and genetic testing, um, a review of the pathology or pathophysiology of breast cancer, um, treatments, including the novel treatments that I do, which are oncoplastic breast surgery and intraoperative radiation therapy. I wanted to touch on some of the health disparities in breast cancer and then um, highlight um, what I think are some of the wonderful things about the Margie Peterson Breast Center. So we'll start with breast cancer screening. So mammograms. Um, there's always a lot in the media about when we should do mammograms. Um, and it's really obvious that, you know, mammograms are a very important part of breast cancer screening. The question is, is that there's kind of a variation um, in multiple different areas on what everybody thinks is the right time to start them and how often. Um, and the problem is, is like when everybody's kind of looking at things from a different angle, uh, it's hard to really come to the same conclusion sometimes. So here shows all of the different um, governing bodies that are out there that talk about the guidelines uh, for screening mammograms for average risk women. So some say it's an individual decision, some say start at 40, some at 45. Um, and so really, you know, the question is, you know, when do we start? Uh, makes you kind of think like, you know, what, what's right for me? 
Um, and so why the discrepancy? Well, unfortunately, um, there was a large study that came out a long time ago um, that was the United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations. And really it was based on kind of imperfect data it was a population study. Um, a large portion of the people in the study were not screened appropriately. And some pa screening patients went outside the study and actually got screened. So what we do know is that breast cancer mortality is reduced with mammography screening. Um, and we also found that higher stage tumors are reduced with screening for those age 50 years and older. Um, where kind of the question always lies is in that 40 to 50 range. Right, and so you, it's really a trade-off on the continuum of benefits and harm. The question is really, you know, can some patients potentially be overdiagnosed, and are they going to lead to false positives um, in these younger-aged women? Um, looking at kind of different age ranges, again, you can see that over 50, there was really a great benefit in that kind of 50 to 70 range. Um, greater than 70, we don't have a lot of data on. But again, that 40 to 50 age range was when they there's kind of a little bit more question about the, the efficacy. Um, really, again, the false positive rates and the recommendation for additional imaging were highest in these younger um, age population and declined with age. But again, false negative rates were very low again in all groups. Um, and the rates of recommendations for biopsy didn't differ either. So when you're looking at an overdiagnosis rate and an overtreatment rate or a false positive leading to patient anxiety, that's where we're really trying to balance this here. Um, and so you're looking at really balancing the risk and the benefit of mammographic screening. So we know that there's a mortality reduction. We know that there's a reduced cancer stage of diagnosis. And we know that re with reduced treatments when breast cancer is found at an earlier stage. Risk, again, is the risk of a false positive rate, um, the anxiety that can come from that, and again, overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So how can we kind of tip the scale here? So this is a picture of breast density. On the left in A is, uh, is what we call fatty breast. Uh, B is scattered fibroglandular breast tissue. C is heterogeneously dense, and D is extremely dense. This is important because the mammogram is really an X-ray of the breast. And uh, on this x-ray here, you can see breast tissue appears white. Unfortunately, so does a breast cancer. So the more and dense breast tissue that you have, it can be harder to detect a cancer in the breast. Um, but again, false positives can be alleviated with choosing the right study for patients. Um, really the greatest thing I think we came up with was, is this uh, 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. It takes multiple thin cuts of the breast as opposed to the standard two views. Um, and this helps to decipher between disease and breast tissue. Again, here you can see on the left is a 2D mammogram where a cancer can really hide in that white, um, but a 3D mammogram really helps to bring light uh, to that little mass that's right there. This really helps to decrease our false negative rate and decrease our false positive rate. And again, everything here is to decrease that anxiety uh, that women have with screening mammography. Mammograms, um, I like to think of that they're kind of like um, a where's Waldo. So sometimes you're looking at your where, where's Waldo picture, you're looking for Waldo, right? If Waldo's your cancer. And many times you're looking and you can say, maybe that's something, maybe that's, maybe that's him, maybe that's him, maybe that's him. Um, so when you have a screening mammogram, this is kind of what the radiologist will see at first. And they may say, oh, I don't, that, that looks like it might be something. And they may call you back for additional views. And really what that is, is that they're then honing in on these areas that looked concerning. So you can see that's not Waldo, that's not Waldo, that's not Waldo, and that's not Waldo. So, um, you know, 10% uh, of women who have a mammogram will have a callback, which means that they'll be brought back for these additional imaging. However, only eight to 10% of those women will need a biopsy and 80% of those that get a biopsy actually turn out to be benign. So that means that less than 10% of women who are called back for more tests are diagnosed with breast cancer. Also remember, we talked about screening and when to start. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, for me, really the answer is age 40. So if you think about starting mammograms at age 40 
and you know you live a nice full life till 85, 90. Uh, we're talking about many, many, you know, 40 years of mammograms. Uh, so for every 10 mammograms that you have in your life, you have a risk of being called back. So I think some of it is really educating women um, to understand that there will be these callbacks so that people understand what that means, that immediately having to go back for additional imaging doesn't mean that you have a breast cancer diagnosis. And also um, that most of the times, even if you need a biopsy, most likely it's going to turn out benign. So what do we know about mammograms? So mammograms save lives. They are the gold standard for screening for breast cancer. They do have limitations, so we have to choose the right study. And breast cancers found early have different treatment options. Overdiagnosis and overtreatment, um, you know, not all cancers are the same and not all of them are going to be treated the same. And there's a picture of me with our 3D synthesis machine. And um, a couple of years ago, we had a campaign with little rubber ducks to squish your duckies for um, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. All right, so a little bit of a re review of breast imaging. So what else is out, out there except for mammograms? So there's MRIs, there's ultrasounds, there's automated breast ultrasounds and sonocine you may have heard of. There's even something out there called thermography. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of what these all mean and why they're beneficial and why they still haven't been able to replace mammogram as the gold standard for screening. So and breast MRIs are not used for screening for breast cancer. Again, it's used in addition to your mammogram. Um, it does require a prone placement on the table, which means lying on your stomach. Um, and it really is looking at blood flow into the breast. So it does require placement of an IV and an IV contrast called gadolinium. Um, here you can see a picture of um, a breast MRI and you can see there's like kind of a big white area in that on that right side there. Um, which is actually the left breast, but, um, and you can actually see all of the blood vessels that are going to help grow this tumor that is growing there. Um, so it may be used if patients have an increased risk for breast cancer above the average risk. Um, so we do use MRI for what we call high risk screening. Uh, this can also be in patients who have genetic mutations such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, it may also be used after a breast cancer diagnosis. It can give us a more detailed look at the breast cancer to help with some surgical and treatment planning, help to better measure the site, look for additional tumors in that breast and look for additional tumors in the opposite breast. But not every woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer needs a breast MRI. MRIs do have their downsides um, because MRIs may find more lesions that are not a cancer and lead to more biopsies. But um, that is, like I said, you know, one of the kind of trade-offs. MRIs are really good at finding things, but they're not really good at deciphering whether it's a cancer or not. Um, the good news about MRIs is that they actually use strong magnets, but there's no radiation involved. Um, so if you do have any metal in your body, you may not be eligible for a breast MRI. Some metallic objects can cause problems, others may not. So always check with your radiologist or technologist prior to an MRI. Next is ultrasound. Again, not used for screening for breast cancer alone, I should say. It's used in addition to your mammogram. So here's a picture of a standard handheld ultrasound. Your technologist uses the ultrasound probe to, to look into the breast tissue for, to search for any masses or lesions. Here's an example of an ultrasound. This is probably a benign fibroadenoma here. Um, and really it's used to look further at any area of concern seen on a mammogram. So sometimes we may even do additional um, views on your mammogram and we still don't know exactly what that is. We may recommend an ultrasound to really better and targeted look at that area. Um, it can help us tell the difference between fluid filled cysts that are unlikely cancer, which may show up as masses on ultrasound, or whether it's a more solid mass that may require a biopsy or further testing to determine if it is cancer. Again, not all solid masses are cancer either. One of the downsides of ultrasound is that it cannot see calcifications unlike our mammogram, which is why mammogram still remains um, gold standard. Ultrasound's also useful to obtain a biopsy of the area or in surgical planning. So I use ultrasound in my practice, so I know exactly where the cancer is in the operating room, so I know where, which area to remove. Again, this uses sound waves to make a picture of the inside of the breast, so there's no radiation associated with it either. 
Whole breast ultrasound, again, is not great for screening alone for breast cancer. It's used in addition to your mammogram. There's really two kind of types that are out there. So these automated breast ultrasound on the left, which is basically a giant ultrasound probe. They take two or three pictures that way, and then it uses 3D technology to recreate an image of the breast. Um, Sonocine is another uh, screening or another like whole breast ultrasound. And really it's a handheld ultrasound that is uh, recorded as a video uh, as opposed to just still pictures. The ABUS here on the left, you can see it really creates a 3D area of the breast. And so you can see, you can kind of scroll through the breast in multiple directions. And then Sonocine looks very much like an ultrasound, but again, it's played through like a video, like a live um, stream of them searching, um, scanning through the breast. There's something out there called thermography. Many of you may not have heard of this, but um, I do like to touch on it because it is out there. Um, so thermography is pretty much kind of what it sounds like. It's a picture that is, um, it uses a special camera that senses heat and is used to record the temperature of skin that covers the breast. The thought is, is that um, tumors are more metabolically active and therefore may have a higher heat signature. Um, and that can cause temperature changes that may show up on the thermogram. There have been no randomized clinical trials of thermography to find out how well it detects breast cancer or the harms of the procedure. And it's really not sufficiently sensitive to be used as a screening test for breast, breast cancer, and nor is it an indicator of risk development within five years. So again, there's no sufficient evidence to support the use in breast cancer screening. Um, in fact, I've seen a few patients who have had these negative thermographies, um, but had a palpable mass that did turn out to be cancer. So um, breast imaging, again, when screening for breast cancer, we want a mammogram, um, 2D or 3D, recommend starting at age 40, and also recommend a risk assessment. We'll talk a little bit about that. In addition to your mammogram, sometimes we do add ultrasounds, um, either to look at areas of concern on the mammogram, or as I said, the ABUS or Sonocine to kind of give a more um, screening type ultrasound. But again, I, we never do screening ultrasounds alone. Um, MRIs and thermography. All right. Some symptoms to bring to your doctor's attention. So people always want to know what kind of things should I be looking out for? So really, um, you know, obvious things are a new lump in the breast or underarm. Um, if you see any new swelling or redness of the breast, changes in the size or shape of your breast, um, dimples or puckering of the skin, um, we, you know, we've kind of moved a lot away from telling women to do and, or monthly breast exams. Um, the reason for that is most women do have some pretty heterogeneously dense breast tissue and many things can feel very lumpy and bumpy in your breast. So what I tell women is really to just be more aware of what your breasts look and feel like. Um, you know, when you get out of the shower and you're getting ready, take a look in the mirror, raise your arms up. Do you see any weird dimples or wrinkles or puckering anywhere? Um, and then also um, if you have any itchy scaly or sore nipples or a rash on your nipple that's not going away, um, pulling in or retraction of your nipple, any nipple discharge, especially if you have what we call spontaneous nipple discharge, which means that um, you woke up in the morning and there was um, blood in your bra or on your nightshirt or nightgown. Um, it's usually not as common of a problem if it's been kind of provoked as far as nipple discharge, but any nipple discharge really should be brought to the attention of your doctor. And then also pain is not usually a symptom of breast cancer. However, if you do have pain in one area that's really not going away, um, that's another reason to come talk to your doctor. All right, risk assessment and genetic testing. So the American Society of Breast Surgeon um, recommends that women over the age of 25 should undergo a formal risk assessment for breast cancer. And then women with an average risk of breast cancer should initiate yearly screening mammograms at age 40. Women with higher than average risk of breast cancer should undergo yearly screening mammography and be offered yearly supplemental imaging, which is usually the addition of an MRI. And that should be started based on um, risk-based age. And then screening mam mammography, I think the hardest thing to figure out is actually when to stop screening mammography. 
the classic teaching is when your life expectancy is less than 10 years. Um, however, it is always hard to kind of predict that. So what I say is, you know, when mammography starts to be, um, you know, a burden on your life coming into the hospital or coming into your imaging center to do it, uh, you know, that's probably a time to think about potentially stopping it. Um, there's no specific age, because as we know, everybody lives to different uh, life expectancies, um, but really it should be a conversation between you and your physician. So genetic testing, very briefly, um, any person diagnosed with breast cancer should be offered genetic testing regardless of their family history per the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Also any patient with a personal history of ovarian cancer. Um, if you were tested prior to 2013 and negative, you should consider retesting due to advances in testing and new relevant genes that we are finding. So the more genetic testing that we've been doing, the more mutations that we're actually discovering. Um, any person that meets the National um, Cancer Consortium uh, guidelines for genetic testing um, should be tested as well, which means that you have a relative who has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation you have a strong family history um, with first or second degree relative with breast cancer less than 45 or ovarian cancer, or you have a strong family history with greater than two first, second, or third degree blood relatives with breast cancer, and one of them diagnosed before 50. Interestingly, um, BRCA1 and 2 very uh, mutations may occur more frequently in the Black and Hispanic populations in breast cancer patients compared to those that are white. Um, and then although the prevalence of these pathogenic variants overall seems similar in black and white women, um, the frequency of genetic testing has historically been lower among the black population compared to white, which is previously resulted in kind of misleading information about the BRCA mutation pattern by race. So we know very classically that it's in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, um, but it's probably higher in our minority populations than we knew before. So um, we'll talk a little bit about risk. So average risk women with, um, with normal breast density are recommended for annual mammography starting at age 40. If you do have uh, increased breast density, you may consider supplemental imaging, like adding one of those, um, what we call screening ultrasounds like the ABUS, the Sonocine, or even a handheld um, complete ultrasound. Um, Women, oh, sorry, this is about breast density. So again, just kind of reviewing um, the, on the left there is the least dense um, and increasing density. So many, most people probably fall within the C category in the heterogeneously dense um, and extremely dense and almost entirely fatty. So A and D are smaller portions of the population. Um, women with higher than average risk um, so you have a, you know, known mutation or prior chest wall radiation um, at an early age, you want to start MRI at age 25 and then start mammograms at age 30. Also, if you have a predicted lifetime risk of greater than 20% or a very strong family history, again, considering um, mammograms starting at age 35. So that's five years earlier than is normally recommended and consideration for additional screening of MRI. Um, women with a prior history of breast cancer who are greater than 50 without dense breasts, all they need are annual mammograms. And women with a prior history of breast cancer that was diagnosed before age 50 um, or with dense breasts, again, may consider addition of MRI to your annual mammogram. So putting it all together. So screening for breast cancer, mammograms are the most important. They generally start at age 40. 3D mammograms are best and everybody should be getting a risk assessment at some point. Um, in addition to mammogram, again, you can consider adding an ultrasound uh, for dense breast tissue or MRI for high risk patients, um, surgical planning or surveillance if you've had a breast cancer under the age of 50. I want to talk a little bit about the kind of pathology of breast cancer and a little bit about breast anatomy. So here's the breast. Um, the breast tissue itself is made up of lobules and ducts. So the lobules are where the milk is made and the ducts are a tubule system that carries the milk down to the nipple so a little baby can feed. 
You can see a normal duct there, unlike the pipes in your house that carry water, these ducts are actually made up of living cells to create these tubes. We can have normal overgrowth in our, uh, in our milk ducts, which is just called usual ductal hyperplasia. When we start to see some atypical cells appearing within the duct, we call that atypical ductal hyperplasia. When there's a significant overgrowth of cancerous appearing cells that are confined to the milk duct, that's called DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ. And when those abnormal or cancer cells start to grow outside of the milk duct, that's when we consider it an invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, so classifications of breast cancer, so non-invasive cancers is ductal carcinoma in situ. We used to think that lobular carcinoma in situ was similar as well. However, we have declassified it to just a high risk lesion and not a um, and not an early stage breast cancer. Invasive cancers, um, invasive lobular carcinoma, meaning that the cancer starts within the lobules as opposed to the ducts, make up about 10 to 15% of our invasive cancers. And then invasive ductal carcinoma make up about 50 to 70% of our invasive cancers. Again, these start within the milk duct. There are some other tumors of the breast that can occur that are not kind of our primary classic breast cancers, and those are phylloides tumors or angiosarcomas. So um, again, here's a picture of the breast. You can see the lobules in the ducts, and then the breast has a lymphatic drainage that drains into the underarm or axilla. Um, and this is why it's important. Uh, this is where the lymph nodes that drain the breast are. And so if you do feel a hard lump in your underarm, it can be related to something that's going on in your breast. Breast cancer stages. So stage zero means that it's confined just to the milk duct there. Stage one usually means that you have a small cancer that is um, confined um, just to the breast. Um, stage two can mean that you've either spread to the lymph nodes um, or stage three, meaning that it's a larger cancer, again, with spread to the lymph nodes. And stage four means that that cancer has spread to other parts of the body, like your lungs or liver. So um, this is probably a little bit detailed, uh, but I did want to talk just to, again, a little bit about DCIS. Um, so again, DCIS, uh, one of the reasons why mammograms are so important is that many times DCIS can show up as calcifications on mammogram. No other imaging is really able to pick up DCIS very well. We don't know exactly how DCIS becomes an invasive cancer, and we certainly know that not all DCIS will turn into an invasive cancer. We just don't know how to predict which ones will and which ones won't yet. Um, so it is important to be able to detect this because this is the earliest stage of breast cancer and again has the best survival. Um, risk of spread to the lymph nodes is low. Um, however, sometimes when we do see DCIS on a biopsy, there may already be an invasive cancer in the same area. Um, and that is again because we we don't know exactly how it might transform um, into an invasive cancer, but many times, if you see an invasive cancer, you're going to see some DCIS near it. Um, I, this is a recent article that was published. Um, it was from the American Cancer Registry of over a thousand women um, who were diagnosed with DCIS. So it looked back at, um, um, it really looking at kind of risk factors for death from breast cancer following a DCIS diagnosis. And a couple of the things that they found were age at diagnosis, so younger age and actually black ethnicity had a higher risk for mortality from DCIS. I'll remind again that the, um, the mortality from DCIS at 10 years is extremely low. It's about uh, 2% of, of patients. That means 98% of patients are alive at 10 years after a DCIS diagnosis. But again, there are factors that increase your risk of being in that 2%. Um, the risk of death also increases after um, an invasive cancer is found in the same breast. All right, so invasive ductal carcinoma, as I said, this is invasion of cancer outside of the milk duct. Um, and it usually presents as a mass 
um, or a discrete abnormality on mammograms, unlike the calcifications that we might see in DCIS. Usually DCIS, we don't really, aren't really able to feel a discrete mass. Um, there's also invasive lobular carcinoma, which I talked about. Again, this is when the cancer starts within the lobules as opposed to the ducts. It is a little bit tricky as well, and it's not always present as a lump either. It may just feel like as a fullness in a particular area of the breast. And then another type of breast cancer I wanted to talk about, these, this can be either an invasive ductal or an invasive lobular carcinoma. It's more about the clinical presentation of this type of breast cancer. Um, it's inflammatory breast cancer, which is a rare but very aggressive form. Um, the breast cancer basically invades into the lymphatic channels of the skin and blocks those vessels. So your breast appears swollen, red, and inflamed, and many people get misdiagnosed as having a, um, a breast infection. Uh, again, tend to not necessarily have a discrete mass, but it rather grows in sheets of cells in these lymphatics of the dermis, making it difficult to detect on exam. So um, when we were kind of going through all the things that you should be looking out for, you can see here, there's clearly a difference in the size and shape of her breasts. Um, and she has a classic pattern um, on that right breast called podiaranch. So you're, it, that basically means skin of an orange. And you can see it kind of has that little dimpling puckering like an orange peel there. Also, I always want to remind everybody, I think that Breast Cancer Awareness Month is always very focused on women, um, but men do get breast cancer as well. Um, usually risk factors can be um, a history of Klinefelter syndrome, uh, strong family history. Most classically is seen mutations in the BRCA2 mutation, um, hepatic disorders or radiation exposure. In men, most of the breast tissue will be concentrated right behind the nipple. So most of the time men will feel a hard mass right beneath the nipple areolar complex. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you can see retraction or ulceration of the nipple um, and nipple discharge in men is much less frequent. 80% um, of these are what we call hormone receptor positive breast cancers. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, we were able to kind of figure out that, you know, we know that there's lobular, there's ductal um, invasive cancers. But even within those, there's more subsets in the types of cancer. And this really leads to differences in how these are treated with medications. So there are growth factor receptors that are on the outsides of the cell. And when a molecule that matches for that receptor floats by, it gives the cell a signal to, defi to divide. So when we're looking at breast cancer, we are actually looking for three things. So whether the cell um, has the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, or a growth factor protein called HER2. And this gives us a few different combinations of the different types of breast cancer that are out there. Um, there's triple negative, meaning that all three of those receptors or proteins are missing. There's hormone positive, HER2 negative, that would mean ER and PR positive, HER2 negative, hormone positive and HER2 positive, or hormone negative and HER2 positive. So those are really kind of the four combinations of breast cancer types that we can see. And this really plays in, as I said, into the different types of medications that be, can be given for them and also the different um, prognosis for these. So we'll talk a little bit about treatments. So how do we treat breast cancer? There's really kind of three things that we treat breast cancer with. So one is surgery, second is radiation, and third is systemic therapy or medications. Um, surgeries, you know, some people might need all three of these, some people might just need um, two of these, uh, just depends on your type of breast cancer and the stage at diagnosis. So surgery, unless the cancer has been found to have already spread to other parts of the body, also known as stage four or metastatic disease, um, all patients really undergo surgery. Um, radiation, again, is an addition for what we call local control, but not necessarily all patients need radiation. And then finally, systemic therapy, which includes chemotherapy, which everyone is familiar with, immunotherapy, and some, and 
hormonal therapy. Again, some people may need a combination of all of these, one of these, or none of these. So um, again, unless the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, um, you, want, you will undergo surgery most likely, and that includes breast conservation or mastectomy. Um, and then you may need surgery on the lymph nodes. If you have DCIS, you may not need um, any lymph node surgery. As I said, the, what we know about DCIS is that it hasn't gotten out of the milk ducts yet. And so if it hasn't gotten outside of the milk duct, then it can't get to the lymph nodes. If it is an invasive cancer, we do need to check those lymph nodes for, for cancer. Um, if you're known to have disease in the lymph nodes already at the time of diagnosis, we may need to remove even all of the lymph nodes um, under the arm. So there's really two different types of surgery for, uh, for breast cancer when we're talking about the breast. And one is breast conserving surgery. So that means we're saving most of the breast and we're just removing the area of concern with some normal tissue around it to ensure that we get all the way around the cancer. The other option is mastectomy, which removes all of the uh, breast tissue. There have been some advances in mastectomy. It used to be that kind of classically, we removed the nipple areolar complex, most of the skin, and you were left flat. Um, there are still some people that choose that for uh, aesthetic purposes, but breast reconstruction has come a long way, and we were able to find that it's oncologically safe to keep the skin and even the nipple in some cases to have either a skin sparing or nipple sparing mastectomy. But then that does require reconstruction to rebuild um, the breast mound. And that is usually one of two ways, which is with implant or with autologous tissue, which means that we actually take tissue usually from the lower abdomen and bring it up to the chest, um, reconnect the blood vessels um, so that you can reconstruct the breast that way. I'm a big, um, big proponent of breast conservation. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the eligibility for breast conservation and some of the nuances of where we've come with breast conservation. So classically, it was up to five centimeters with clear margins on resection that's able to leave an acceptable cosmetic result. What I can do with oncoplastic breast surgery is do larger tumors without sacrificing this cosmetic result. Um, we do want good margins. Um, so really want to make sure that we are around everything. And in fact, in DCIS, you want a little bit more margin than you need for an invasive cancer. Uh, just because DCIS can be a little bit sneakier because again, it moves along those ducts and doesn't really grow out like a mass. You do need to have, or I shouldn't say always, there's always caveats, but generally breast conservation is paired with radiation. Um, and the good news is, is that survival is actually the same in patients with breast conservation and radiation therapy compared to mastectomy. So what we found was that your chances of dying from a breast cancer has nothing to do with what type of surgery that you do. In fact, there's some new data out there that's showing slightly better survival in patients with breast conservation, as well as safety in young patients who traditionally opted for mastectomy. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I do, the oncoplastic breast surgery. Um, so this is Dr. Silverstein. He is one of the um, fathers of oncoplastic breast surgery um, and is a big proponent of breast conservation as well. Really, it utilizes plastic surgery techniques to perform the partial mastectomy or breast conservation surgery. Um, it allows for really wider removal of cancers with immediate reshaping of the breast tissue to provide really a good cancer operation, but also preserving the um, aesthetic and cosmetic outcomes of the, of the breast. Uh, we can reduce the need for multiple operations to completely remove the cancer. In classic breast conservation surgery, you really are in a, in a struggle between you want to take out enough tissue and make sure that you're around the cancer, but you don't want to take out too much because you may then compromise, again, the shape and aesthetics of the breast. So I think this is a really useful tool for the removal of larger cancers in patients who may have otherwise been advised to have a mastectomy previously. Um, we can also modify the opposite breast to create symmetry without the need for another operation. So it can all be done at the same time. 
we've come a really long way in what we uh, are doing in surgery. This is a radical mastectomy in 1971. Um, we used to think, again, that you had to remove everything. We removed all of the lymph nodes, as much of the skin as possible. We removed the, all of the breast, and we even used to remove the underlying pectoralis muscle. Um, so we really have come a long way. Um, oncoplastic surgery, uh, you know, can be something as simple as hiding a scar or simply rearranging a little local tissue to fill in the gap created by a lumpectomy, or it can be a little bit more involved, which would be um, combining a traditional lift procedure or a reduction procedure with the tumor removal. Um, depending on the extent of the surgery and the training of the surgeon, this may be performed exclusively by a breast surgeon like myself and my partner, or done in combination with a plastic or reconstructive surgeon. Um, one of the things about oncoplastic surgery is that it really does involve designing an operation to fit the patient. Um, we want to incorporate a woman's goals for the operation, as well as taking into account the size and location of the tumor and the patient's breast size and shape in the operative plan. There's a lot of different types of oncoplastic surgery out there, um, but really um, I just wanted to touch on um, a couple of case reports here. So this is something that we, um, Dr. Silverstein has deemed as uh, extreme oncoplasty. Um, so this is a 65 year old patient who discovered to have multiple left breast masses um, spanning approximately 90 millimeters or nine centimeters. If you remember back to a few slides ago, I talked about what patients would be eligible for breast conserving surgery. Um, it used to be that if you had kind of this, what we call multifocal disease or multiple masses in, in the same area, um, that, was, that person was not a candidate. And also five over five centimeters in size that you really weren't considered um, a candidate. This patient had all three of these lesions biopsied and they were all invasive ductal carcinoma. Mastectomy was suggested to this patient because of the large span of her disease. The good news is, is that she has large breasts um, and the cancer really is kind of all confined to one, one area there. And this is a great, great patient for oncoplastic surgery. So she um, was marked out for a standard left reduction excision um, and a right reduction uh, for symmetry. Um, I actually don't use wires anymore, um, but this patient, we put wires in to kind of bracket where the lesions are. Now I use ultrasound uh, to see where the, these lesions are in the breast to appropriately remove them. Um, this is a very large piece of tissue that was removed, so 412 grams. Uh, and I just want to show you her cosmetic result here. So she was able to have a uh, reduction. Um, this is on the right, four years post-op after chemo and radiation. Unfortunately, whole breast radiation does cause some shrinking uh, of the tissue on that side. So what I tell my patients is, is that if you do have whole breast radiation, that breast is gonna fight gravity a little bit more than the one that didn't have radiation. So you tend to see um, in the coming years a little bit more um, ptosis or sagging of the non-radiated breast, but generally a great cosmetic outcome. She can feel her breast, she can feel her nipples, um, you know, wear a nice bra, all of those things without having to have had a mastectomy. So oncoplastic breast surgery really aims to create a tailored approach for each patient. Um, I never sacrifice the oncologic outcomes for a cosmetic result, but using oncoplastic surgery really helps to minimize any of those cosmetic deformities. Again, can be done with or without a plastic surgeon depending on the breast surgeon um, and should be considered for all patients undergoing surgical intervention for breast cancer. Next, one of the other novel approaches that I, um, I do is something called intraoperative radiation therapy. So radiation, as you saw in that last picture, classic radiation is full breast radiation following your lumpectomy or breast conservation, uh, reduces your local recurrence risk by about 50%. Um, there's a number of factors that determine your local uh, recurrence risk. Um, and then this is a picture of kind of the classic um, external beam radiation that patients would get for whole breast radiation. Then there's a subset of patients that we consider for what we call partial breast radiation. 
And this can be done by external beam where they only target a portion of the breast or by something called intraoperative radiation therapy. So IORT is a highly targeted treatment that delivers a dose of radiation um, to the tumor bed at the time of surgery. Results of clinical trials have shown low side effects and very promising results. Um, and we are currently offering this treatment to carefully selected patients. This is not a new treatment. It has been around for about 20, over 20 years now, um, but um, we're still collecting data on it. But so far, um, really the recurrence risks are not significantly different than those with whole breast. Um, IORT is given again, given again during the surgery. So it's nothing additional. Classic whole breast radiation is four to six weeks of radiation, five days a week. Um, this again is a one time you're under anesthesia and it's directed right to the area where the cancer was. Nothing remains in the breast after surgery. And for many patients, this is the only radiation that they'll need. Here's kind of a schematic. So we remove the tumor. The balloon applicator is placed into the cavity. The radiation treatment is delivered um, right to the surrounding tissue where the tumor was removed. Um, usually about 10 minutes or so, this says eight, it's about 10, uh, and the balloon is removed and the cavity is closed in whatever fashion um, we're using. Um, so here's some picture, more pictures of our oncoplastic uh, breast surgery. So preoperatively, um, this patient had something called a racket mammoplasty. So she needed some of the skin removed on that right lateral breast. Uh, this is two weeks after surgery and intraoperative radiation therapy, and six months after um, surgery and IORT, she did not have any tissue removed on that left breast. We just lifted that side a little bit. So for this patient, she said her breast cancer was like a hiccup, a small detour, and a minor inconvenience, and that's really what we want for patients. I think that cancer patients, the best thing that you can give them back is time, and so if we can save you from multiple weeks of radiation, um, that really gets you, you know, back to normal and back to your life very quickly. Um, just again, to touch on um, finally, some of the medical treatments for breast cancer, um, chemotherapy um, can be given before or after surgery. Again, not all women need chemotherapy. And in fact, in our patients with that estrogen or hormone positive breast cancer, with small tumors, um, even some who have some disease in the lymph nodes, we can now send a special test called an Oncotype DX. Um, this uh, analyzes the actual cancer genes, the genes of the tumor, and helps determine its risk for recurrence and whether you would benefit for chemotherapy or not. Um, again, we are saving a lot of women from chemotherapy that we're really not getting a good benefit from it. There's also hormonal therapy for those estrogen positive breast cancers, tamoxifen if you're premenopausal usually, um, and aromatase inhibitors usually if you're postmenopausal. Then there's also immunotherapy. So that protein that we talked about, the HER2 protein, uh, those patients get immunotherapy targeted to that protein. Uh, they're called Herceptin and Pergetta. And there's now other new immunotherapies um, being tested and used that are showing really great promises. Um, which are PDL1 and PD1 inhibitors in triple negative breast cancers. There's also now um, CDK46 inhibitors. Again, a lot of this may be a little bit more than you need to know, but I think it's nice to, to have this information or heard this, and that's in hormone positive HER2 negative advanced or metastatic breast cancers. All right, let's see. Okay, I'll go through this quickly. Um, we're almost there. Uh, so, and then I just wanted to touch a little bit on health disparities in breast cancer. Um, so in 2020, um, you know, there were 46.9 million Americans who identified as black or African-American, which accounts for about 14.2% of the total US population. Um, although some cancer associated genetic mutations are inherited like the BRCA1 and BRCA2, most health differences between population groups do not seem to stem from biology, but from variations in socioeconomic status and access to medical care. Um, the black ethnicity um, tends to have the highest death rates and shortest survival rates of any racial or ethnic group in the US for most cancers. And black immigrants have a lower cancer mortality than US black born people, highlighting the importance of where a person lives over race or biology. Um, there's a lot of things that really contribute to these disparities. So structural racism, 
um, redlining, which is, you know, the government kind of drawing lines in the sand of where people were given access to loans and things like that, which really created a divide in the socioeconomic um, status. Um, diversion from historically Black neighborhoods of public transportation, grocery stores, and public green spaces. This really limits the availability of affordable, healthy food and opportunities for physical activity. And this environment also increases the prevalence of chronic stress, infectious disease, and other exposures that create that contribute to poorer health. Um, 2019 to 2020, 19% of Black people were living below the federal poverty level compared to 7% of white people, and only 28% had completed four years of college compared to 41% of whites. Cancer risk and mortality um, does increase with decreasing socioeconomic status regardless of race, race or ethnicity. And the higher prevalence of cancer risk factors due to marketing strategies that target these lower income populations, um, environmental and community factors, as I mentioned before, and unequal access to high quality care. Again, this access to care, very important. It really influences the use of prevention and early detection services, as well as receipt of cancer treatment and survivorship care. Um, one of the largest, largest obstacles is the high, the high quality care is cost, um, which of course is exacerbated in black uh, people with disproportionately low insurance coverage. In fact, insurance coverage is closely tied to employment. However, black people seem to be further disadvantaged by having a higher likelihood of inadequate health insurance, even with employment. Again, comorbidities are very, um, play a role in our breast cancer risk. And so uh, the black population does have a higher, so having a higher prevalence of other chronic diseases, which may be an independent um, risk factor for cancer. So diabetes is more common in the ethically, ethnically black population. Um, and that can increase your risk for all kinds of cancers as well as heart disease, stroke and high blood pressure, which can also increase your risk for cancers. Um, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among black women. It's estimated that 36,000 cases will be expected to be diagnosed in 2022. Um, and the overall breast cancer incident rate was um, 127 for 100,000 in black compared to 132 um, in white women, although the rates are higher in younger black women uh, under the age of 40 than in white. Black women are two times more likely to be diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which um, when we're talking about the different types of breast cancer, uh, triple negative breast cancer is more aggressive than our estrogen positive breast cancers. And black women with triple negative breast cancer are 30% more likely to die than white women. Also, they're more likely to be diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer, which I talked to you about previously. So here are some statistics. Um, so there's a higher mortality, even despite the lower incidence, there's a higher rate of triple negative breast cancer, and there's a higher stage at diagnosis. So there's a lot of factors that go in um, to the disparities that we see between, um, between white and other ethnicities, but specifically in the black ethnicity. Some good news though, um, in all ethnicities, breast cancer death is declining. Um, that's definitely due to the introduction of, of screening mammography and our advances in our treatments for breast cancer. Uh, however, you can see that there still remains an inequality gap in the death camp, in the um, death rates for breast cancer. All right, wrapping it up here, I just wanted to tell you um, a little bit about the Margie Peterson Breast Center and what makes it unique. Um, so we do have multi-disciplinary uh, breast cancer treatment. So we take a really collaborative and holistic approach to your breast care uh, delivered by highly trained and innovative specialists. Patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer who are referred to our center are able to come for basically a one-stop shop appointment. Uh, they get to meet with a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, and a surgical oncologist, along with being offered genetic testing so that they leave there with really uh, a, a plan and an understanding of what their breast cancer care looks like going forward, um, as opposed to having to make three different appointments with three different specialists and try to figure out how all those pieces come together. 
Uh, we offer personalized and novel cancer treatments. As I said, um, it's really important to tailor the treatment to the individual. Um, everyone's breasts are different. Everyone's goals are different. Everyone has different um, uh, you know, personal beliefs, um, genetic risks, all of those things play into it. And everyone has different types of breast cancer, which is going to really change their treatment options. We do use the latest techniques like intraoperative radiation and oncoplastic surgery. And as I said at the beginning, I'm part of the St. John's Cancer Institute. So we also do breast cancer research and have access to many clinical trials and treatments to help move uh, the treatment for breast cancer forward. We have a wonderful thing called the Breast Health Clinic. So um, this includes everything from screening and diagnosis to high-risk care and high-risk assessments, um, as well as survivorship for um, uh, patients after breast cancer. Uh, I like to make sure people know that we are there. So say you wake up in the morning, your friend wakes up in the morning, they feel a lump in their breast, or they've noticed nipple discharge or whatever it might be, you have some sort of breast concern. The Margie Peterson Breast Center can get you in, um, have an assessment by a specialized breast uh, nurse practitioner um, who can usually get you same day imaging and get you to diagnosis very quickly. Uh, you don't need a referral from your doctor, but most of our uh, local OBGYNs and primary care physicians know that we're there. And if they, their office gets called, they generally send their patients to us. So I like to make sure everybody knows that that is there. We're there to get you in and get you to an answer quickly. Because again, most of the time, um, it's not going to be a breast cancer. And we also have wonderful cancer wellness programs, and we have support programs to really cater to the whole person. Um, we have nutrition, mindfulness, stress management, physical therapy, and counseling services available. Um, and I think what makes Margie Peterson Breast Center unique is that we really have such a wonderful team and really wonderful patients. Um, and... Um, so oh, um, I did say I was a Dodgers fan. So there's me and my dad at the Dodgers game a couple of weeks ago. Um, I thought it was really cute. Uh, I was driving past Venice and they have Venice, the Venice sign uh, lit up pink for October. Uh, and then when the Dodgers won the World Series uh, in 2020, they lit up the Ferris wheel blue. So um, yeah, thank you. Here's my um, contact information um, and information for appointments at our breast. Uh, can you put that last slide up? Uh, yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. Yeah. So people yeah. can, if they want to write that information down. Absolutely. So we'll open it up for questions now. Any questions from anyone? Yes. Wow. Yeah. That was, I, I, that was excellent. I Thank really you. Um, and some of the, now, would any woman who uh, would go to like a, any center get that intraoperative radiation? So let's say, you, you know, a big center, like if you went to UCLA, you went to Cedars, even um, what is the county hospital? Would, is everybody doing that? Or is that just something that you guys are doing? So not and, uh, everybody is doing it. Um, you know, it is used around the nation. Um, mm -hmm. Cedars it says that Cedars does do it. I think they do mm -hmm. it very rarely. I don't think that they do it nearly oh. as often as we do. Um, okay. UCLA does not offer it. Uh, oh. USC okay. does not offer it. Um, City of Hope offers it only at their main campus out in Duarte. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, both my partner, uh, Janie, Dr. Silverstein, who I showed you a picture of, and he does mm -hmm. IORT down at Hogue. Um, mm -hmm. But those are really, you know, it's pretty much us and Hogue um, in the Southern California area that are really doing it very uh, frequently. As I said, it's if you look at Cedar's website, they do they do offer it. Um, although mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of patients that have really it, gotten wow. it. Good to know. And another question: What about the the ono cl plastic? Ono -plastic? Does yeah. every what was every does everybody do that or 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 is that something is that new stuff too? I mean, again, none of that stuff is really new. I, I think it just takes time to mm -hmm. get as as mainstream and 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 as prominent. Um, you know, I still have patients who choose very standard incisions for their surgery, and there's nothing wrong with that. They 
-hmm. you know, they're like, I just don't want, I don't want the other side touched and not, you know, I, this is fine. I say, that's great. You know, we have a lot of information out there that really shows it doesn't increase um, your surgical complications. It doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't increase any of your risk. So it's kind of a great bonus that can come out of this. But again, some people are just like, I just, I, you know, they're not interested and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if Mm -hmm. you've always thought about a breast reduction or you're like, man, just, you know, this having kind of a little shining light out of it, like I've always wanted a little lift. um, Mm -hmm. This is the time. And again, it really Mm -hmm. can help us take out nice big pieces of tissue um, Mm -hmm. and preserve the cosmesis of the breast. I would say that pretty much every health center you go to will say that they offer oncoplastic breast surgery, but mm-hmm. most of them require a um, plastic surgeon be involved to do these ah. surgeries. Mm-hmm. Um, my partner and I at the Margie Peterson, uh, Dr. Jane himself are trained in oncoplastic breast surgery. So we do our own breast reduction and breast lifts as part of our cancer operation. So there's, you don't have to coordinate with another surgeon or anything like that. It's just us. And we're able to offer, um, you know, these great cosmetic outcomes. Okay. And if I have some more questions. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I, the, I was interested to know how does diet, how does high blood pressure and diabetes increase your risk for breast cancer? I thought stress and everything, but how does How do those things increase your risk for breast cancer? Yeah, I mean, not specifically. I think a lot of it goes in, probably plays more into the general cancer risk that we see as far as disparities um, in, in, um, uh, you know, in different uh, populations. Mm -hmm. But certainly, you know, all of those things, um, again, not as much as, as, maybe other cancers, um, okay. but, cancer. but they're all, they're all, they all play in there again, okay. probably not as high in breast cancer, but just showing that those things are definitely seen in higher in the black population and that mm-hmm. can be your risk for all kinds of cancers, not just, mm-hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, pretty much like there's not a specific link, but it's kind of all in the, the general cancer risk elevation. And then one last question, is there a, like a, a preventive breast cancer diet or what should you, I mean, besides eating healthy fruits and vegetables, when a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, do you give them a certain diet to try to follow? Um, so there's no, there's no one specific diet. There's nothing really that you need to cut out. You know, there's a lot of Mm -hmm. stuff in the media and out there about Mm -hmm. reducing your estrogens and not Mm -hmm. eating soy and all those things. Mm -hmm. But what I tell all of my patients is, is that everything is okay in moderation. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's really is just about eating a well-balanced diet with good fruits and vegetables, um, and really maintaining a healthy weight is more important than specifically what you're eating. But again, that really just whole balanced diet and definitely more, um, you know, more fruits and vegetable, more fresh mm-hmm. foods oriented, mm-hmm. but okay. I mean, it's all the things that we know. It's just, again, yes. this talks about some of those socioeconomic, um, yes. struggles that you have, right. What's more mm-hmm. expensive, the salad or the McDonald's burger, right. I mean, yeah. Um, and so when you're struggling so, financially, it's much harder to, um, you know, in yeah. any, in any yeah. way to make the right choices, uh, when they're not necessarily the easy choices on your wallet. So, mm-hmm. well, I'm finished. Thank you. Once you again, your talk was excellent. I Thank learned you. so much. <laughs> Good. Wonderful. Well, that's my goal is to, to educate and to spread the word of all the things that we have mm-hmm. going on in breast cancer and the great things that we have going on at St. John's. Yeah. Okay, Pastor Rhonda has a question. Absolutely. Okay, good afternoon, family. Okay, so um, Lady Kathy, you brought a question to me. So, okay, so help me, um, give me a minute while I talk through this question. <laughs> sure. So we know that what cancer is, is an abnormal cell that didn't leave the body. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And when we think about nutrition, Mm -hmm. and this this might be far-fetched, but I literally just got this question after 20 (laughs) years of serving in the cancer world. Is the healthy eating helping to move those abnormal cells 
out of the body or is it a effort to simply keep the rest of the cells healthy enough to continue to keep us strong yeah i think it's i think it's probably more of the keeping your body healthy and having it work at its optimal level um you know at the end of the day, there's a lot of risk reduction and prevention. And I certainly like to make sure patients understand that they didn't do anything wrong. If they do get a cancer diagnosis, it's not like, oh my gosh, I definitely should have eaten healthy and I would have never gotten a cancer. We can't, we can't prove that at all. Um, we just know things that reduce your risk, but never down to zero. What happens in cancer is a, basically your body, when a cell divides into two, um, has to duplicate the DNA of that cell and sends one copy and one copy. Um, if there's a mistake made when they're copying that DNA, then that creates an aberrant cell. Your mm -hmm. body has all kinds of really amazing um, kind of checkpoints and uh, pathways that actually go through and check all these new cells. And they go like, you're good, you're good, you're good. And they're like, oh, you're bad. And they destroy that cell. What happens in cancer is that it mutates in a way that is able to evade those checkpoints and that's how it starts to grow. So your body doesn't figure out that that one's a bad cell and it is able to continue to replicate. So I think what the, the healthy eating and the risk reduction there is really more about keeping your body working at that, you know, that optimum level um, to make sure that all those things are working appropriately. Okay. And my last question, Deanne, please, is um, <laughs> can anyone, regardless of their insurance or lack thereof, be serviced at your facility? So unfortunately, we don't, uh, we don't take uninsured patients. Um, we do, um, we, you know, if you call our center, we will work very hard to help you find a place where you can be. We don't just I would say we're not a place that just hangs up the phone and says, sorry, not here. Um, but, you know, especially with the, the great access to, to care that has been initiated, um, a lot of our patients now do qualify for Medicare, which we do take. Um, we allow for cash options if you don't have insurance, but we don't have options for just completely uninsured patients, unfortunately. I, I wish that we did. We just we don't, we're a private hospital as opposed to like the county hospital or the other public hospitals that do take uninsured patients. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Great presentation, Crystal. Thank you. Uh, my question is similar to Rhonda's last question. So if a person has, say, health care through mm, health net or something, can they come to your center to be diagnosed or to get treatment? I'm pretty sure we take most most private insurances as well as as med you know all the different types of Medicare. So um, uh -huh. my uh, my assistants are really good at you know when you call they'll ask you for your insurance information they check it immediately. We'll never bring you in if you don't qualify. But as I said, it's really just I think we we don't take Medicare aid and we don't take um, uninsured patients. But other than that, we pretty much take everything. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I have another question I forgot. Sure. You know, I've been having mammograms for 25 years. You didn't yeah. really mention, is there a risk to having all those mammograms? You know, by the time I'm 80, you know, it'll be... <laughs> <laughs> you know, quite a few years. Yeah, um, we really haven't found any data that shows that mammograms lead to breast cancer or any negative effects from mammography. The radiation from mammography is very, very low, um, mm -hmm. even though it does use radiation. Um, and even in our 3D mammograms, which take a few different slices, um, we don't see a significant increase in the radiation. So um, if you think about, um, so we all receive background radiation just from everything that we do in our lives, walking around all of our devices, everything like mm -hmm. that. So a mammogram, they say is equal to about seven months of just background radiation. So it's exceedingly low. 
um, as far as what we're, we're exposed to for the mammogram. And the risk benefit, the risk of, um, of it causing a cancer in the future versus the benefit of it finding a cancer early on, um, the benefit way outweighs that exceedingly small risk from the, the radiation from mammograms. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, I also I like to say like, for example, I mean, um, people never think twice when they get on an airplane and fly across the country, everybody's like, you know, uh, vacation, visiting family, things like that. I mean, we're talking like that's, at, you know, at least a hundred times the radiation of a mammogram, if not more. So, um, so there's, you know, a lot of radiation that you receive just sitting on an airplane. And as I said, most people don't blink twice about that, but they get very concerned about their mammograms that could save their life. So I, I want to make a comment uh, yeah. about the insurance issue. I know uh, Providence has a very active department and I've worked with them on other projects that will help individuals uh, find the most appropriate insurance for them. Yeah. I'm not sure what the, uh, the, the title is, but that department has worked with patients uh, in some other programs that we've worked with with Providence. So I know they have that. They do. My, they're, they're very good. I mean, again, if you call, it's not like we just like turn you away. Like we're going to find, you know, if you have a breast issue or concern, we certainly um, help you find an appropriate place. If it's, if not, um, we, I know that they do offer, you know, helping you to fill out your Medicare uh, applications if you qualify or get you um, health insurance and, and work really hard to get you connected if you do uh, if you do come to our breast center. So, um, as I said, we, we, we work really hard. We just, um, we can help you get your insurance. We just can't see you with, with no insurance. So the other, uh, comment I was going to make, and, uh, maybe Crystal, you can take this back to the organization, yeah. because one of the things that I asked Crystal when we met privately is what is St. John's doing to, uh, mitigate the disparities in treatment uh, for African-American women, for black and brown women. And it seems that uh, with no insurance and your inability to take people who are uninsured or even underinsured, uh, that is going to decrease access to a lot of uh, women, African, black and brown women who could possibly qualify, who could possibly have some outstanding outcomes from that type of surgery. So the, the charge that I would say from, and this is me personally, I don't know about the, how the rest of you feel, is to help St. John's figure out a way to be able to service more what we would consider indigent patients or more patients who don't uh, qualify, who, who are, have no insurance, you know? Or uh, so some, somehow or another make, put that, uh, on a, on a burner, not the back burner. Uh, I prefer it to be on the front burner. Sure. But, uh, you know, yeah, I, can take that back to, to, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, I know that there, there have been a, not, a lot of initiatives in the past that with, um, you know, getting out, um, screening mammograms and working with you know, different facilities and mobile mammogram machines and things like that to go to lower income areas, um, to try to get free mammograms out there. And I, you know, if you do, as I said, um, I'm, I am certainly not versed in all of the things that we do there. Um, I know that uh, uh, Becky, she's wonderful. She's kind of over our breast program and um, breast wellness and things like that. She is so well connected. And that's why I said, nobody who calls gets just like turned away. We really do work very hard to find mm -hmm. you those answers. So even if it's, you know, I agree. I want to, I wish we could do more. And I know that they're looking at ways in which we can do more, but we certainly don't turn anybody away. We really try to make sure we hook you up with care somewhere. Um, and I know, again, I think that, you know, all those like mobile mammogram machine, mammogram stuff that all stopped with COVID. So I'm hoping that'll all start back up again mm -hmm. um, as well. But, you know, I mean, I think one of the other things that's really nice that we do is, is, a little bit different from some other places. As I said, when Janie and I are doing that oncoplastic surgery, you know, we build that hundred percent through insurance. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of women, I think, um, 
who are lower socioeconomic status, like if you can just get the health insurance, which I said, St. John's will help you with those applications and help point you in the right direction of how to gain that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a lot of the reconstruction, a lot of the oncoplastics uh, or even reconstruction after mastectomy can be very costly to patients. And so, you know, employing a plastic surgeon in Southern California um, can be an additional cost. And that's something that, that, that we certainly um, are able to offer without having to add in an additional physician, additional fees, all of that. So mm -hmm. um, Helena, one way. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Helena Ooh. Sheila. Yes. I agree with you because, you know, they have all these bells and whistles, not just, not just um, at that facility, but other facilities, but when they're not available to people with Medi-Cal or people without insurance, then the disparity just increases, it just continues. There's no end to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, not, that, that was my point. That was the point I was trying to make. Thank you, Sheila. I agree. I mean, I, we're, we're working on it. Um, yeah. You know, I it it's it's, it's definitely in, in the works as to how we can do it. You know, and the the downside and the unfortunate side of um, healthcare is, you know, the the business costs and the cost of it all, and it, it is very difficult for you know everybody is is hurting a lot after COVID, um, including the hospitals and all of that, and trying to figure out how to do all that. I know is is hard at the system level for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know that St. John's definitely is is got um, in, not in the breast cancer world, but in the colon cancer world, got a great um, donation and grant um, right. to actually go out and help to decrease. Uh, you know, sorry to not decrease, but to um, increase red access rates. to colon yeah. cancer screening with Cologuard yeah. and get mm -hmm. that out for free to people. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, as I said, I know we've done free mammography before and we're hoping to get that, you know, going mm -hmm. again, because as I said, that's really the most important. Um, if we can get you diagnosed and help get you diagnosed, um, that's really where it starts and we keep keep moving from there. Yeah, we are yeah. intimately involved with the Colon Cancer Project, the Pastor it's, Rhonda and I, and some of the other people on this call. Uh, that's, it's our, incredible and, and yeah, our definitely very- the hub. Yeah, we're, we have a great partnership with Providence. And, yeah. And that, right, yeah. Any other questions or comments? We, we should talk about how that could possibly work to get yeah, St. John's. Yeah, we should-, we should uh, Definitely happy to happy that. to take yeah. that back and and yeah. try to figure out what you know kind of initiatives we can start um right. to help with that yeah pastor Rhonda and i'll be start some conversations and see what we can do that'd be great let me know as i said let me know what i can do and yeah, yeah bring certainly, that back certainly. and yeah. happy to partner with you on looking looking at ways that we can improve that because i i mean i agree yeah. there's definitely you know i um I trained in Macon, Georgia. And so, you know, we had a very large black population that we treated and it's amazing what I saw as far as the disparities in, um, in almost the unfortunateness of what people chose. Um, like so many uh, people in a lower socioeconomic status chose mastectomy because they, even though they had a small cancer that was really treatable, um, they just wanted a mastectomy and they wanted to go flat because they needed to just get back to work as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. They couldn't right. deal with, you know, coming back and forth for radiation. Right. We were, you know, I mean, I don't think of Macon as a very large town, but they were from much smaller towns, you know, a couple hours away and they didn't mm -hmm. live near radiation centers and things like that. And mm -hmm. so I certainly look at, at what we're doing and um, look at it as like, these are definite opportunities, I, I think for people like that, right. To be able to have breast conservation, you know, small incisions and intraoperative radiation and get back, you know, back to what you're doing. Um, but I think it definitely starts here with what we're doing and, um, yeah. trying to spread the word and really make this more popular of a, of, of treatments out there and try to get more people to, know about them and, uh, you know, forcing other institutions to employ these methods as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know UCLA, for example, doesn't do IORT 
And I've talked to some of the breast surgeons there who say that, you know, they lose patients to us because they, people are looking for these, these treatments and these opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do see that as a huge opportunity for, um, you know, Mm -hmm. for the lower socioeconomic class, because again, if we can get, as I said, cancer patients, the best thing I can do for you is give you back time and get you back to your life faster. And if that means that you don't have to do four to six weeks of radiation, that's a big difference. You know, I mean, if you need the four to six weeks, then you need it. There's really no, there's no way around that, but there are patients that certainly um, are eligible. Any other questions or comments? Uh, okay, I'm going to, Yvonne, are you ready to? I am. Okay. So you want to do, we're going to pull a name for the $50 Amazon gift card. Actually, you can stop recording now to Yvonne. One second. <laughs> 